Okay, cool. Um, after that introduction, I don't know if I should maybe change my talk. Uh, but my name is Ian Kaywood. I'm a developer. I like to learn new things and I like to share things with my teammates. I like to make things easier for other developers, like myself as well. Um, and I also like to challenge the status quo. So if I see something that's not working the way that I want it to work, um, I try and make and change, change it. Um, so I work for a company called Nona. It's a software development studio. Um, we're based in Woodstock. We focus on a lot on growing learning and um, high quality. Cool. So I came to this title after the last two years I've been working in the React Native ecosystem and a lot of the things that we've been learning is working through the problems a lot on the side of iOS and Android. So these things that we've learned, they're not specific to React Native. Um, a lot of the stuff can be used in iOS and Android. Um, so I'd like, I'd like to share that with everyone. So uh, I, I put up a, a little thing here that might escape some people that are afraid of dentists, but this is an automata. And I think automata is really cool. And the idea behind it is like what probably drove us to work in these kinds of spaces to start like automating things, start making things really cool and reusable. Um, so I'll quickly cover what inspired this talk, um, how you can go about developing a culture of automation within a team, um, how you can focus on long-term speed of development instead of just speed of development, um, how we solve these issues in our team, and what's in the future, not in everybody's futures, just what's in the future with, <laughs> with our stuff and how we are gonna <laughs> automate um, apps. Cool, um, so the key learnings that we had that inspired, really inspired this talk was that we were a JavaScript team comprised mostly of Ruby developers um, trying to do a React Native project. So working in a new framework with completely new technologies, iOS, Android, all of these things, we just thought, okay, cool, we know some JavaScript, this is gonna be fine. And <laughs> obviously, <laughs> that's not how things work. And we had to improve things so that we can actually make things palatable for ourselves. Um, we were constantly solving build issues multiple times for different developers. We had no consistency with environments. We didn't know what was going on in Android and iOS. We had two developers in the company that had some iOS and some Android um, development experience. But then again, things are so tightly coupled for some build steps in React Native that you can't really rely on even that resource. So we kind of just had to learn this ourselves. We had inconsistent production builds, and this one is like a big thing that inspired this because that is really frustrating. It's time consuming and like difficult to debug. I don't know if people work um, with mobile apps, but it's like, it's a little bit of a different space. Um, and then uh, lastly, we had dependency on key members. I, at one stage, didn't feel like I could take any leave. <laughs> I, like, I, I couldn't really, I couldn't really take leave and then um, focus on taking time off because then there would be a deployment in between and my machine was the only one that had the deployment keys and the deployment production settings and all of those things. <laughs> it is, it is it's terrifying. <laughs> so the first thing that I wanted to cover is starting to develop this culture of automation. And I didn't really call it DevOps because we're a bunch of developers we we just wanted to automate the processes. Like we, that's all we wanted to do. We we didn't really care that much about um, solving big problems or anything like that. We wanted to solve our problems, and we wanted to to make that sustainable within our within our team as well, so that we could find time to do these things. 
So my first thing is getting buy-in from developers, and that's like or teammates, um, not just developers, because your team comprises of um, more people, scrum masters, designers, there's also POs, all of these people are, are a part and part of, like part of the team. Um, and I am focusing mostly on developers for this, um, for this one. And that was the easy part, I'll be honest. Like, we wanted things to be easier for ourselves. And we wanted to make sure uh, that people would grow and learn and everything. So just put a tool in front of someone that solves the, the issue and they'll be happy to learn it. But they need the time for it. And that's where the next, like, the next part is really important. We really wanted to get buy-in from POs. And this one, I think I, think I was uh, quite lucky as well because the product owners at my company, they, they were really keen to give us freedom to innovate and to, str to try these things out. And like, that's, that's one of the things that we saw quite from the start is that we need to try things out. It's not just like a silver bullet. It's like it's, it's not just it's gonna we're gonna automate this thing. It's gonna be beautiful. Never gonna change it again. It, it doesn't really work <laughs> like that. And I think everyone knows knows that that's the reality of things. Um, and I saw at the start was was me just being uh, a little bit annoying, I guess, um, and just putting documentation, putting books and articles in front of in front of people and say like, these people have tried it. It's worked. Let's try and automate these processes so that we don't have to deal with this frustration. And then there's other, there's other benefits to automation that, that, that comes through massive failures, obviously. <laughs> so <laughs> unfortunately, um, we were working on an app for Quicket and we had to do a production deploy on the day of the production deploy, I wanted to just upload the APK because I'd built the APK. It was nice. I put it onto the uh, Play Store and it said that the versions were um, wrong. So the versions were lower than the ones that were accepted by the, by the Play Store. Obviously, um, me being quite new to it and thinking everything will be fine, I upped the versions, created a new APK, and uploaded it directly. <laughs> and that ended catastrophically because the app crashed a bunch of times while in production for Quicket. <laughs> and uh, this, is <laughs> this is not ideal. And it's not, not a thing that I want to relive. So I just put this in front of the PO and says, I don't want to do these things. I don't want to be the maniac that pushes code directly into a production app without even going through any kind of PR process. Like, I don't want to be that person. I, just, I, felt, I felt at that point that I was kind of trapped in the thing, like, it has to happen now, so it has to, it's like, but if you have these processes in front of you, if you have a, a pipeline where the, the app actually goes into, into beta, it goes into production, there's like, there's, there's barriers before. It actually sees the Play Store before, before you have to, put the APK on the Play Store. Like, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing more frustrating for a PO as well to have the day of release not be the day of release and for that to be delayed and not even that but to have failures on it as well. And then the last thing that I saw was really important was I know that we, we feel like we know all of the things that need to change and it's, it's, it's true, but there are other features and everything that has to, has to go in, and we have to be pragmatic about this and prioritize the things that are most important, that are causing the most pain for us right now and making sure that that gets... Because if you, I can promise you, if you flood a PO and say that we need to make all of these changes, then you have the chance of the PO picking none of them. And that's really not a position that you that you'd like to be in. Cool. So one of the things that I really liked 
Um, and this is this is a sentiment to my it's it's my it's my teammates as well because they were willing to do all of these things. They were willing to go into new tools to try and learn things to be uncomfortable, and that's that's great to have with your teammates. But there's also there's also like a push from from everyone to make these small changes when you can. So that that's stuff that's common in the in the developer space. I feel is to refactor constantly. Like you, we're not writing perfect code. None of us. You look at code that you did a year ago, and well, what what is this person doing? Why did this person do this? And you look at the commit history. And it's you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we don't do these things perfectly the first time. We have to keep making changes. We have to update this stuff constantly. So I also, also wanted my teammates to, when, when they see an opportunity to do these kinds of things, so if you, if you see an opportunity to make a bigger refactor, it's going to take a long time. But that you think will make things more stable, then at least add it to the backlog and talk to your teammates about it. Maybe your teammate has another idea that can make that even easier to do. Maybe he has a simpler idea in mind. And then I think the third one is something that's very, it's, it's very dear to me because I really care about documentation. I really care about reading something and understanding it and being able to use it. And that, for me, is something that's sometimes lacking in our local repositories, so the repositories that we internally maintain. We read documentation for other companies who say, oh, these doc this documentation is so great. And then you think, why, why don't we spend some time doing that kind of documentation in our team? And that, that's what it is. It just takes, it, it's a little bit, of, little bit of updating all the time that goes quite a long way. When you're changing something, and you can see that the documentation is going to update, ask someone to look at it and have them work it through you so that, so that two people can then understand how this documentation looks. And then another thing, it's, it's quite like communication obviously is key in software development. And this is one thing that I saw that was really, really important. If something feels like it's holding you back, then talk to your teammates because your, one of your teammates might have already solved this and through no fault of their own have not committed it to the repository, have not automated this. The two of you can work together and, and actually <laughs> automate it. Or maybe it was already automated and you just have to commit it in. Because I know that we all have our little scripts and everything and that can be refined just a little bit and be used by everyone. Cool, so the next, next big thing that I wanted to talk about is not focusing on just development, but just focusing on long-term speed of development. So one of these things, th this is also, so these things that I'm talking about, they're not, they're not all glamorous. It's not, it's not like, it's not all of the things that it's like you write this, this function and it's beautiful and you never have to change it again. This is all stuff that we know in the back of our heads, but that we've seen through pain that actually makes a difference. So one of the things that we really saw is to make your code base good for ease of accessibility. And I didn't really use onboarding here just because this means that a developer can join the project without much effort. It doesn't necessarily mean that they, they can get all of the credentials and everything that they, that they need and all that, because that, that is another problem altogether. But if the code base is easily accessible, if, I can, if someone can look at the code base and say, this is where I add a new feature if I want to add a new feature. This is where I add documentation if I want to add documentation. This is where I actually look at the documentation. <coughs> These are the commands I run to start the project. And then 
another thing that's really important for me for stability is working towards consistent patterns. Now, I really don't want to um, hop on about like a dogmatic view of patterns and like if you use a pattern, it has to be that pattern. Everything has to be that pattern. That's, that's not really um, what I'd like to focus on. It is more of just keeping consistency key throughout your whole development cycle so that people can change things when you make changes because that is always going to be the case. If something, if something comes along now and in two months the requirements change for it, you don't want that to be a big pain. And this kind of stuff helps with it. And then another thing, if there's a key person, and I know I said this earlier, but if there's a key person, ensure that there's a plan to share their knowledge. Because that doesn't always just happen. I know that if, you, if you're really busy and you know that you hold key information, then it can be really difficult for you to make that time to share that key information if there's no plan to do it. So this is talking to your other teammates, talking to your PO, and making sure that everyone knows that there's a key piece of information that you're holding. And sometimes even not fixing the thing that's obvious to you and letting someone else fix it and helping them to fix it. And then another thing is I really think tests are useful. And I, and I think I'm, I'm talking to the right room. So <laughs> unfortunately, not all developers share this sentiment. Um, but I have seen the value that tests hold in the times when things are really on fire. When you have to do work at 12, and it's not always, and it's not, it's not a common thing, but when you have to do work at 12, you're tired, you're a, little, uh, you're a little unmotivated to do the work, but if the tests are there, and you have that cover, you have that thing that says, you can't change, you can't just change these things without thinking about it. You can't just do these things. Okay, so one thing that we were looking at the whole time is are we focusing on the right things? At the start, it was really easy because things were on fire. And like we knew we were focusing on the right things because we were automating the builds and we were automating. Um, all the little things, but then as you as we got along, we saw that actually our builds are they're working most of the time, but sometimes they're failing for for arbitrary reasons. so why is this happening like are we f are we are we doing the builds in the right way? are we using the right tool? These are constant things that are evolving that you can't just say this is the thing that we're using, and that's how it is for all the time. And then the next thing follows on, it's we shouldn't be scared of removing stuff. We shouldn't be scared of removing a tool that's not working out. We shouldn't be scared of, of making a different test pattern, of saying, actually, I don't think our tests are covering that much. We need a little bit of rethink. We need to, we need to think about how our tests are actually covering us with our code. Like this, these are difficult things to see, but it's a, it's a constant thing. This is a constant conversation between your teammates, between your PO, making sure that things are actually moving in an upward trajectory, like not just seems like it's moving. And the last thing is I think that we should try and play to our strengths. Like if you have teammates that like doing documentation, or if you have teammates that like writing tests, ask them about how to improve it. Ask them about how you think the tests can be improved. How do you think that we can move away from Redux for some of our some of our internal states? Like how how can we actually do these things? Like not just use things because they're there. 
but actually think about how things can change. Okay, so is a little bit of of the story of how we got to all all of this and how we solved it in our team was a lot of the stuff that I have just been talking about, but I'd like to talk a little bit about more about the actual things that we used and why we use those things um, and how this stuff is not it's not tied to the things that we use. It's not tied it's not tied to a React Native project, it's not tied to an Android project or an iOS project or even a Flutter project. These are things that you can use across the board. So for for me I think a thing that's important when you look at these big problems is to start small and solve the little things that you can. If you have things that you don't know how to do or or you have to take a long time to learn or something like that, then make sure that you make time for it. But also keep iterating on the small stuff. At the start, we just used a lot of NPM scripts. We used NPM scripts, we used bash shells, just to just to start getting a getting a flow into we started we started making our local environments easy to use. This is stuff like ENVs being easily able able to switch between ENVs between um, dev, staging, production, whatever you wanted. And this is just taking the contents of an ENV file, copying it into a main ENV, and restarting the bundler for React Native. That's all we did. That's a small change that makes a big difference. Because now, instead of me going into my EMVs, checking that I have all the right staging EMVs, copying it into the, into the file, and then restarting the bundler, I'm running a command. And that command is much more powerful, but it's still doing the simple things. And then we started having a policy of PRs require tests. This was unpopular. <laughs> um, but PRs were immediately rejected by Circle CI if they didn't have a test. <laughs> Uh, and that's, that's something for the team that was hard. It was hard to do because testing in JavaScript is not as easy as testing in other languages. And the only reason is because you have to choose what you want to test in. Um, there's just like there's way more open specifications. There's like you have all of these different things to choose from. Now you have to write in a specific way that someone else chose, and you don't even know if that test is covering anything. Not only that, you have to change the way that you're writing your code, because most JavaScript code is not written in a modular enough way so that you can test it. So you have to change the way that you think. And that, that was the difficult part. But also, I know that people are keen to learn. And I know that my teammates are keen to learn. And showing them how it looks when you actually test something, how it looks when you, when you break something into more modular code, even in JavaScript, it looks good. And it looks stable. And then my, my biggest thing that I want to stress is that you have people in your team that know certain languages. So use the tools in the languages that they know. There are so many tools that we can use. And I think that we should be adaptable, definitely. And that sometimes we should just bite the bullet and learn a new language. But also you want things to move fast. And you want people to be comfortable making changes. And the way to do that is just to choose tools in the languages that people already know. Cool. For me, there's a really important thing 
kind of lacking in, in some development teams is developer experience. Everybody's talking about user experience. And to me, that matters to a certain point. But I really care about developer experience because I want to see my teammates being happy. I want to see my teammates being happy to work on the same code base as me. And the way that you get that is by improving their experience of the stuff. So if I'm using certain tools, I'm really happy to use it. Just because they have good documentation, they have easy to follow tutorials, that's a good developer experience. So I want that to be in my team as well. So for me, obviously that first one, it frustrated. Um, and just having easy and clearly defined workflow. So if someone knows exactly what they need to do to get a piece of work in, that's a really good place to be in. You don't want you don't want your developers to wonder if they have to if they have to write tests or if they have to do these things or they have to do these things, if they have to follow these rules. You want those rules to be predefined in some kind of codified way so that they can follow it. And if they have disagreements with it, you want them to be able to change it as well. Cool. So in React Native, I don't know, has, has anyone here had some experience with React Native? OK, so that's not a lot. <laughs> but you do, you do quite a lot of reloads and everything, and keeping the state up to date and making sure the state is in the right way when you're trying to test things, that can be quite difficult. So it's really, it was really important for us to find a way to make development faster because we were reloading the whole time and taking a lot of time to get back to a state where we could test the screen or something like that that we wanted. And even if we did get to the screen quickly, we had a state that was, that was not exactly what we wanted now we, we're getting to a stage where even that is easier to do as well. But at the start, that was really frustrating to work with. But the test, if you can write your code in a nice modular way, makes that development process much faster. And then you only need to reload once or twice to see what it actually, the whole flow actually looks together. Uh, I think. This last one, the custom Redux middleware. I'm not. I'm not sure. Does Does everyone know what Redux does? More or less. Well, Redux is a state management system for for JavaScript, and with Redux you can write some middleware that looks at the actions and does things on those actions for you. And we've written a couple of of middlewares that does some some cool things. That's just gives us more information. It's only visible to devs. No one else uses it. And it's stuff like performance metrics within the app. How long does it take to get from one action to the next? So if you're fetching data, if you want to know how long the app starts up, you measure from action to action, tells you how long that is. And you can actually say, oh, it's ma we've, made it, we've made it faster. It's not a thing of, it looks faster. It is faster. So it's a much easier way for us to know how things are how things are going. Um, another thing with this is we have a lot of dev buttons, dev functionality within within our apps that is only visible to devs that no one else gets to see. This is stuff like clearing the state, stuff like um, doing direct transactions for this, for this um, app that we are writing right now. It, it's, it's all things that no one else sees that offers no um, value to anyone else but us. It makes our development experience better. Cool. So we already talked a bit earlier about how production <laughs> builds need to be consistent. But here's where we really saw 
a lot of gain. I was, I was building all of the apps on my local machine with all of the production settings, everything on here, and just hoping that it works out every time. <laughs> Obviously, it's not going to work out every time. And having something then at a start, we didn't we didn't run any of the stuff on on a build server. We just we just added Fastlane, which is a CLI tool that runs builds, and that that's all that's all it does. It's a it's a tool that makes sure that you can write scripts to run your builds and to upload it to the Play Store, upload it to to the iStore, all of those things. It just makes it easier for you. Then once we got to a point where we could just run a command to do a deployment, then we moved it over to Circle CI because now you have a consistent environment running a consistent command. And if something happens to Circle CI, I still have the fallback of just running the command on my local machine. It's a little bit of extra effort, but like it's still there. Okay, so when we started this out, we had Ruby developers, and there's no no tool in my knowledge that does mobile apps for Ruby, or at that time at least. And we just kind of thought React Native would be really cool to learn, and there was a high demand for, for mobile apps. So that's the main reason we chose React Native. Um, at the time, we looked at Flutter as well, and it was too new to do um, anything on it. Uh, we chose Circle CI because most of us had already used it before. Obviously, you can use any other CI CD server, it, it really doesn't matter. We chose Fastlane because we had Ruby developers, and then the only non Ruby developer wrote most of the Fastlane stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but having all of the Ruby developers near me while I was doing this was really helpful because I didn't really know what I was doing in Ruby specifically, but Fastlane made a lot of sense. And it is, it is syntactic sugar above Ruby in any way. So it looks more like, uh, it looks even more like a scripting language than, than Ruby does. Well, we used Crashlytics beta just because it was free and it was easy to use. And now we've switched over to Google Play's beta and test flight because I still, well, I always <laughs> acquired test flight. Um, and then we use Storybook as well. And if there are other web UI developers here as well, I would really recommend adding Storybook to whatever you have. It just makes it makes component development really easy. So if you're using any kind of, it's, it's not um, geared specifically towards React. So if you use any kind of framework, um, it makes it really easy to see what your components look like. And React Native, it made it easy for us to navigate to pages. So we could see how a page looks like without all this other noise involved, without state involved, without all of the other stuff. We can just see what it looks like. We can focus on the UI only. That's really helpful because we have a front-end developer that doesn't do much of the Redux, doesn't re do much of the API, and doesn't need to know about all of the other stuff that we are doing. Cool. So I just wanted to show you a little, this is a very, very basic graph of what our pipeline looks like for beta deploy. And this this is this is kind of the point of it. I didn't I didn't design something that was extremely robust or anything like that. I just wanted to notify people if there's a problem and if there's a success. Like that's that's it. And I mean we've we've gone back and forth about how we want to do our beta deploys and we have done scheduling 
we've done automated deploys on develop, and now we have moved over to a manual. I don't know what we're going to do in, in, in the future, but the, but the point is this stuff is all iterative. We, we're going to change it if we see an, a different way to do it. And if I keep it nice and simple, keep the jobs all separate, then I can fit the workflow however I want. And that's, uh, that's the word that Circle CI uses as well. So this is, this is just an explanation of the workflow that we have on Circle CI. Cool. I just quickly wanted to show as well what a basic fast lane lane looks like. It's very simple. It's not, we're not doing anything, anything crazy here, but this, this simplified everything for us so much. We just needed a couple of steps to build our app. And then we take that app and we upload it to the Play Store. That's all we wanted to do. We don't, like, we're not, we're not uh, DevOps professionals. We're just developers and we want our lives to be easier. And that's like, this is really useful. This is really useful for us. It's really useful for n our customers as well because they get to see their apps really quickly. They get to see their they beta build. Cool. So I, I just want to share a little bit about what what we're looking at doing in the future. Um, at the moment, we don't. We have we have versioning, but it's very very basic, like um, iteration. And we would like to use semantic versioning for us. We already, we already do stuff with conventional commits, and um, I really like the structure of conventional commits. If, if, if anyone else wants to go read about that, it's, it's, really, it's really a cool way of splitting out your commits and then using those commits to figure out a version upgrade for, for your app. And then this, we also really want to be able to release patches easily for iOS or Android. At the moment, we're releasing across the board for iOS and Android at the same time. And we realize that that's not always going to be the case because they have different requirements. But we're, we've been working with it at the moment, and it's been working pretty well. And then we'd also like to tag releases automatically. Um, all of this stuff, fairly easy to do with a nice plan um, that we're luckily going to be able to implement in the next month, which is nice. And then I just wanted to show you quickly what a basic um, conventional commit looked like. I don't, um, these, these, are, these are three of my recent commits, which is just a refactoring. And this, if I want to, trigger a release for this, this wouldn't release. Um, so, and the reason for that in semantic version, versioning at least, and I'm not sure quite yet if I agree with it, but is because nothing functionally has changed. So if I were to make a commit that said fix, that would release something new. If I would make a commit that said feed, it would release something new. Um, and that can be really useful because now, instead of the user seeing all of these things like refactor and having new releases for that, everything that is not actually adding functionality, they're only getting releases that matter. And then another thing that I'd really like to add is the ability for QA developers or POs to upgrade a beta to a production build. Um, currently, we don't have this. We merge into master. When that merge is done, it triggers a production build. Um, and this would be also a nice, nice addition that's not really difficult to do that adds a lot of value. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. have time for a few questions. 
very quiet crowd. There we go, there's a question. At ScaleConf, they incentivize questions by promising prizes, so maybe we should start doing that one day. Um, so you mentioned you're doing semantic releases and refactoring doesn't count as a reason to do a release. Um, but considering refactors could change a name that would change the API and break the API, you would have to release a new version yes. going and by semver specs. Would you um, have to change how you do your commit <coughs> yes. to account for that? Yeah, there's a so there's a way that you can add breaking change in the in the commit uh, the rest of the commit so that it triggers it. Um, so there is so there is a way to get around a refactor that you know is going to make a breaking change. So yes. Any more questions? Cool. Thank you, Ian. Sure. <laughs>